All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to today's Authors at Google session. Um, I'm Tim Wild, for those of you who don't know me. Um, today we're joined by Joyce Chaplin, PhD. Uh, she's an award-winning author and the James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History at Harvard University. Um, Joyce will be talking to us about her most recent book, uh, which most of you have copies of, uh, Round About the Earth, Circumnavigation from Magellan to Orbit, uh, in which she explores the full history of around-the-globe travel uh, over the course of almost 500 years. Uh, so without further ado, thanks for speaking with us, Joyce, and here you go. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to be speaking about um, this book that I did uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and I kind of miss as a project. Um, it was really, really, really fun to work on, uh, so I'm always delighted to talk about it. And I'm going to begin um, with an invitation, um, a kind of imaginative exercise. Um, please imagine that for some odd reason, you have ordered your very own around the world kit, um, uh, which comes in several pieces and requires uh, special delivery. Uh, it takes the form of a theater in which you're going to stage your own around the world voyage. You're going to manage that. Um, the kit will require special delivery um, because the theater itself, which is round, um, is about 8.25 meters across, um, uh, in circumference, I mean, so just under nine feet across. You can just about enter it. Not very big, but surprisingly, um, uh, the other components turn out to be even smaller. Um, as you discover when you enter the theater, on the door of the theater, you'll find an envelope. The envelope has a map and a magnifying glass. Uh, the map marks with an X a particular spot within the theater, and you're going to need the magnifying glass to find what is at that spot marked X. Um, it is a tiny ship, a ship the size of a uh, head of a pin. Um, beside that ship, you'll find a microscope, and only with its help will you discover that what looks like look like tiny bits of dust on top um, on, on the ship uh, are tiny sailors, um, like specks of dust. Uh, there are tiny dolls that represent the men who keep the ship on course. Now, this kit that you've ordered has these kind of bizarre dimensions because correctly proportioned to each other, the theater is the Earth, the ship is the Victoria, the first ship to make a circumnavigation. Um, and the tiny dolls are the sailors, uh, the angels that dance on the head of this particular pin. Given the high mortality rates uh, during most of the history of around the world voyages, sailors were indeed angels in the making, about to die. Um, their tininess and the smallness of their ship make a circumnavigation of the comparatively enormous globe seem impossible, and yet it happened. Uh, over and over, hundreds of thousands of times, and even more circumnavigations are taking place right now as I speak on every level of the Earth, um, be beneath the sea, on the surface, and in orbit. With those repeated embraces of the globe from 1519 onward, human beings have established what is now a nearly 500-year tradition of going around the world. It's the longest tradition of a human activity done on a planetary scale, 500 years of a planetary activity. Around the world, travelers therefore make a grand gesture, um, as big as the physical world itself. Even though they are individually so small that the huge global stage on which they make those voyages uh, makes them hard to find. Um, I like to say that I found uh, the topic of circumnavigation in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, seven years ago in St. George's, Bermuda, I embarked on a 140-foot sailing ship, the Sea Education Association's um, sailing school vessel, the Corps with Kramer. Uh, so off I went with a group of students. Um, I was going to be at sea for three weeks. I was an instructor and deckhand. It's a very interesting combination, um, uh, and it was uh, a three-week stint that I would spend away from telephone, internet, everything. It was actually kind of blissful uh, to be removed from all of that. But I was in the middle of a project. Um, my book before this one was a project on Benjamin Franklin and science. Um, 
And this was going to require me to read material in French. So I decided when I was at sea for these three weeks, being a deckhand, occasionally teaching, I would brush up my French. Um, and I was going to bring a novel in French. Completely by chance, I picked uh, Jules Verne, uh, Le Tour de Monde en 80 jours, Around the World in 80 Days. Um, first published as a newspaper serial in 1872. So when I wasn't on watch or being a deckhand, I made my way pretty slowly at first through this French novel. Um, and my French was good enough, kind of to my surprise, that I actually enjoyed the book. I really got into the story, which I, a, a lot of the details of which I'd kind of forgotten. Um, um, and as a historian, I appreciated the period detail of the novel, the late Victorian era. And I especially appreciated the nature of the bet, the wager that sends Verne's character, Phileas Fogg, racing around the world. Um, at his London club, um, Fogg uh, remarks that scheduled travel services could now put a person around the world in 80 days. And his club, fellow club members don't believe him, that, so they say, prove it, uh, and so off he goes. Um, that 80-day measure, 80 days around the world, was only conceivable by the late 19th century. Um, in the age of sail, um, going around the world would have required weeks, if, uh, I'm sorry, months, if not years. So my sailing vessel would have lost uh, Phileas Fogg his bet. 80 days would have been impossible. It was the invention of steam power, um, but also the creation of regimented European empires around the globe. Um, plus commercial uh, travel services that together made it just possible by the 1870s to go around the world in 80 days. So I appreciated the period detail of the novel. The second thing that impressed me about Verne's story was how the material developments that sped up global travel required a dramatically increased use of natural resources. When Fogg leaves London um, on his voyage, he takes his new valet, Passepartout, um, the, the comic uh, character of the novel. The two men board a night train, uh, which has scarcely departed London when Passepartout lets out, as Varen says, a real cry of despair. In the rush, my state of confusion, I forgot to switch off the gas lamp in my bedroom. Well, my dear fellow, Phileas Fogg replied coolly, you'll be paying the bill. Now, the gas lamp is the novel's running joke. You know it's burning the whole time, 80 days um, of gas burning in someone's bedroom back in London. Now, true, it's only a small part of the journey's cost. But we present-day readers of Verne quickly realize that the joke is on us. Um, we are notoriously the first generation that has realized what the planetary bill for centuries of burning fossil fuel is going to be. And Verne himself uh, recognized this um, on some level. Um, he does not discuss a carbon footprint uh, for this 80-day journey, but it's represented in the frontispiece, the illustration, uh, where Passepartout and Fogg are gazing up at the world that they're going around, right? There they are, with various modes of their transport represented, elephant, sailing ship, and so on. But in the middle of that globe, if you notice, there's the gas lamp burning, burning, burning for all of those 80 days. Fossil fuel represented in the very first page of the novel. In Verne's era, coal um, and other fossil fuels um, were costly but essential parts of modern progress. Yet Fogg's steam-powered exploits set at the height of European imperialism represent a phase of the past that truly is history, meaning it's now over. Airplanes have replaced the coal-burning locomotives and ships that hurtled fog around the world. The empires that protected some people at the expense of others have been replaced with other political regimes. It's now difficult to cross the surface of the world in 80 days, though easy to fly around it if you can afford the ticket and if your government gives you a passport. So that is what I learned at sea. Once I was back on land, I looked for a history of around the world travel. I thought, well, there must be one, and there was one. There was none. So I wrote one. Um, I decided uh, that that was a gap that I did absolutely want to fill. Um, so here we are. When I began the book, I very quickly decided that there was no point in trying to document all of the around the world voyages, even all of the important ones. There were far too many. Um, I didn't want to write an encyclopedia. That's not what the book is. It records a number of firsts. They're all there. You can look it up um, as a reference work, if that's the way you want to approach it. But really, the part of the book that I thought was important was its argument. I wanted to explain 
why a circumnavigation is distinctive. Why does going around the world matter in the larger scheme of things? It matters because it shows how human beings have been thinking themselves on a planetary scale for a fairly long time, for almost 500 years. Um, circumnavigators have generated nearly half a millennium's worth of evidence of humanity's direct, tangible connection to something that's usually perceived in the abstract, the whole Earth. And this is really significant, uh, that we have this history um, of thinking of ourselves in relation to the planet very, very tangibly for almost 500 years. Now, of course, humans have had a relationship to the planet for as long as they have existed. But consciousness and awareness of that connection is, has been thought to be only very recent, from maybe the 19th century onward. Most people in the more remote past are not usually thought of as having any conception of themselves on a planetary scale. Um, they were supposed to be uh, thinking small, to be tucked into very small parts of the globe and to only kind of think of themselves locally. So it was allegedly only by the 19th century that mastery of the oceans and penetration into continents gave Europeans, um, Western Europeans, the world's first version of a planetary consciousness. Um, augmented by developments in science and geography. Um, and it was only supposedly, again, uh, with the famous Apollo 8 photographs of 1968, the Apollo 8 photographs of Earth, that humans first truly grasped their place on the Earth as a whole. Today, of course, we're hyper aware of our connection to the planet, given our ongoing environmental crisis, most of which can be attributed to human actions in generating matter, that overheats the atmosphere, clogs land, air, and water. Um, we use our planetary consciousness today both to praise and to criticize ourselves, to emphasize our greater scientific awareness about the Earth, for example, but also to stress our unprecedented transformation of it. Plus, there's our sense of globalization, um, a key word everyone talks about now, globalization. Surely we must have a greater awareness of the planet given the globalized culture in which we live, the global connections we know, we now have with people all over the world, um, not least represented in international um, uh, uh, business education efforts, uh, such are, as are represented very well here in Cambridge. Um, but it may just be the case, I think, that no one has looked hard enough to find a longer history of planetary consciousness. If you don't look for it earlier, obviously you're not going to find it. Part of this has to do with the fact that globalization has really hogged all of the attention. Globalization. Global is social. Um, it implies the human-to-human -human connections among people over the entire globe. Um, in contrast, planetary is physical. Um, it implies um, the physical planet itself and humans' awareness of how they are connected to that physical place. Far more studies, a lot more journalism has been devoted to the former than to the latter. Globalization, again, hogging all of the attention. And that's because human-to-human -human interactions are usually what uh, historians and journalists focus on. Um, only recently, for historians, have human relationships with the non-human parts of nature been put into dialogue um, with the, the human-to-natural interactions that are the other part of history. Um, and so we have only really begun to read historical documents thinking of the natural world, the physical world, as a context for understanding human-to-human -human relations. So circumnavigators' long tradition, 500-year tradition of engagement with the planet questions our sense of historical uniqueness. Maybe we're not the first generation that has a planetary consciousness. Maybe it's not something that only emerged in the late 19th century. Instead, circumnavigators' awareness of the planet may teach us something worth knowing about why we think about the Earth the way that we do. Now, I found that the pre-modern uh, circumnavigators starting in the 1500s onward were by definition not only thinking of themselves in relation to the planet, but doing something in relation to it, meaning they went around it. Circumnavigation, again, is the oldest human activity done on a planetary scale, and it's 16th century sailors who did it first. That's really kind of astonishing. Uh, with a technology we no longer think is very efficient, they did it. So I'm going to proceed now to point out um, three ways in which circumnavigators describe themselves in terms of a full planetary existence, um, traditions that, again, we still have. Um, um, first of all, the circumnavigator's paradox. This is the day that is gained or lost in going around the world, um, crossing what we now refer to as the International Dateline, the IDL. 
Um, it had been theoretically known. Um, astronomers uh, had, and geographers had speculated, yes, this should happen. Uh, if human beings go around the world, their calendar will shift along with them. Um, but no one had experienced this until Magellan's surviving crew made it back to Spain in 1522, having lost a day. I like that kind of random, having lost a day um, as they did so. Um, so ever since, the temporal transition has been a hallmark of a circumnavigation. If you were to ever go around the world over the poles, hyper-technically, that's referred to as a transpolar voyage uh, because you, there isn't the temporal shift. It's not technically a circumnavigation, believe it or not. It, it lacks this hallmark characteristic of gain or loss of, of a day. All travelers change their place on the globe. They move through space. Only circumnavigators change the day on the calendar. They change their place in time. Um, second, circumnavigators mark their voyages on maps and globes as an entire, again, planetary circuit. Uh, the first example occurred around 1530 with a small globe um, probably made in Nuremberg with the route of Magellan's expedition scored all the way around it. Um, so you see in the Atlantic Ocean the voyage going out south through the strait that would bear Magellan's name and then coming up around um, uh, Cape Horn in Africa. I'm sorry, uh, Cape of Good Hope in Africa. Um, this becomes, again, another hallmark uh, of the circumnavigator's passage, uh, the, the swoop around the full globe, the desire to mark on a map or a globe how you did it, um, that this is um, the circumnavigator's track, um, was the first graphic representation of a human planetary activity and becomes very characteristic. So this is a beautiful map with Magellan's track made in Venice around 1540. You see it more clearly there. One of my favorite examples, though, has to be um, Francis Drake looted his way around the world, um, gaining a lot of, of silver from the Spanish Empire. So when he got back, he had this beautiful double hemisphere map made with his track that you can see made in silver, <laughs> the element um, that he had uh, returned uh, with. Uh, so that's what he wanted, uh, his circumnavigation marked as. So the temporal element, the gain or loss of a day, the representation of an entire planetary activity through the circumnavigator's track. The third element was how circumnavigators took the physical globe as their personal emblem or accessory. <laughs> the first to do so was Sebastian Elcano, the commander who survived Magellan. Uh, Ma Magellan is the most famous man never to go around the world. Um, uh, he uh, died in the Philippines, um, and it was El Cano who brought the surviving ship, the Victoria, back. Um, uh, he uh, was rewarded by the King of Spain with a coat of arms that featured a globe. So was Francis Drake. So you see Drake here with his coat of arms. It has that globe with the, his ship, the Golden Hind, teetering on it at the top. Um, later on, James Cook would be awarded um, a coat of arms that also features a globe. Um, there would be a lot of portraits also made with circumnavigators holding or leaning on a globe. And that is really interesting because previously to this, the only people who would be pictured with the whole world as a kind of personal emblem would be God, Christ, and rulers, monarchs. Um, for ordinary civilians um, or commoners to gain this as an accessory was quite extraordinary. Um, and again, marking a kind of understanding of how going around the world was so distinctive. Um, so many circumnavigators, beginning with Drake, um, had portraits made of them in which they hold globes. Again, something that only monarchs or Christ um, had done so. Um, so from the 16th century onward, circumnavigators claim the privilege of claiming the whole world to mark their accomplishment. So um, as I discovered these elements of circumnavigation um, defined very early from the 16th century onward as a characteristic way in which people could have a relationship to the entire planet, um, I defined around the world travel as a geodrama. Um, using the Greek for Earth, Gaia, and for action, drama. Um, now, within the European countries that sponsored the first circumnavigations, there was an established tradition of considering the world as a theater. Theatrum Mundi, um, all the world's a stage. Um, this was an ancient Greek idea, updated in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, um, and exemplified in Shakespeare's claim that all the world's a stage. Um, the Theatrum Mundi was a metaphor, obviously, but around the world travelers made it into a reality by presenting themselves as actors on a stage of planetary dimensions. 
And over time, circumnavigations would be presented as dramatic entertainments, first in print, then on stage, and today on film. Uh, geodrama is different from geography, uh, which studies depictions of the Earth made by writing, graphos. While geography engages the human eye and the hand and the mind, geodrama requires all of the body, um, everything all of a human being um, and its range of physical experiences in relation to Gaia, the Earth. That whole body experience um, of the whole Earth is well documented in the accounts of circumnavigations, which describe what it felt like from agonizing to exhilarating, depending on the period of time when the circumnavigation was done, depending on the person's experience. In fact, most people do not and have not gone around the world. Um, it's a minority experience, but everyone knows something about how it should be and how it might feel. Um, everyone has some idea of the big statement uh, that a circumnavigation makes through geodrama. Um, for that reason, published first-person accounts were the primary sources that I used for the book. And frankly, the more famous the account, the better, because that indicated uh, the extent to which there was an audience for that work, and uh, many more people um, knew about it by reading uh, or experiencing it. Together, the accounts of circumnavigation constitute the longest and most sustained way in which people have been able to consider themselves as actors within a geodrama, even as the drama changed over time. And here let me go into the basic stages or changes, um, which can be expressed as three acts in the drama, three phases in which humanity comprehended uh, their place on and their experience of the world. Um, in the first act, which lasted from Magellan's departure from Spain through to James Cook's death in Hawaii, um, so 17, uh, down to 1779, the sailors who went around the world did so in fear. And it was reasonable for them to be fearful, uh, given the dangers of an around-the-world voyage in the age of sail. Um, it was in this initial phase, the longest, if you notice, in the history uh, of circumnavigation, that death prevailed. Um, humans might take on the planet, um, but I think of it as if the planet could just shrug them off, which the planet routinely did. I will go into the confidence and the doubt later, but I want to talk, uh, just give it some more detail about how the fear was actually a very rational response. Um, the death rates on early circumnavigations were, in fact, appalling. And here, this is why I'm using PowerPoint rather than Prezi in order to get all the data in. I did not cherry pick the worst experiences. These are absolutely representative. Um, uh, attrition rates for these early expeditions could reach into the 90th percentiles. Mortality rates merely in the 60th and 70th percentiles were considered quite good. Uh, the expectation eventually was that you could not possibly expect to return with all of your ships. You would lose some along the way. If you brought back one or two, that was great. Um, so as you can see, the attrition um, was built into the experience of the expedition. So having a fearful attitude about taking on the entire planet through a circumnavigation was entirely rational. Um, let me just give some comparisons. Mortality statistics for naval battles and for maritime disasters were in fact lower <laughs> than for circumnavigation. So three examples, the first European voyage to India only 50% of the men lost. The Spanish Armada casualties on the Spanish side, 66%. And then the Titanic disaster of the 20th century, 68%. This is just to give a sense that uh, the dangers of a circumnavigation combined the dangers of war and disaster. That was the proportion um, of mortality that people would have experienced. Um, um, as well, um, again, it was expected to lose ships, um, giving some indication of the extraordinary expense of trying to put on a circumnavigation for a nation state uh, that would send out such an expedition. Um, so of the five ships that Magellan commanded, only one returned. Um, three famous expeditions that followed, I'll show this to you again, um, lost all of their ships. This meant that the few survivors we know um, came back to Europe, got back on someone else's ship. Now, that was the before picture or the early picture of circumnavigation. Let me move to the improvement um, in the 18th century, when through deliberate effort, the mortality rates went down. <coughs> the idea now was not to lose most of the men and ships, but to keep them. Um, return rates, return, rates of return for circumnavigations um, shot up into the 90th and 80th percentiles, reversing the earlier pattern entirely. Um, 
uh, survival rates just in the 60th percentiles were now considered troubling <laughs> rather than amazingly good. Um, so from the 1780s until the 1920s, what historians call the long 19th century, a kind of 19th century extended on either end, during this period of time, travelers who made their way around the world did so with a striking confidence that they could survive the process. They and their companions would make it. Um, this was because Western societies had generated technology and political networks that seemed to have conquered the globe. It was not only possible to go around the world, but it became a popular pastime. Uh, there were costs, not all of them hidden, uh, but they seem outweighed by the glories and the ease of making a swing around the planet. And so, over the end of the 18th century and over the whole course of the 19th century, going around the world was no longer an achievement confined to the ranks of professional sailors, <coughs> but instead available to a broader range of people. Two examples. The first handicapped person, James Holman, who was blind, went around the world in the 1820s. Uh, the first woman, a stowaway, had gone around the world in the 1770s and a handful followed her, but the first woman to do it alone, all by herself, and confidence that she could do this, um, managed to do that in the 1830s. Ida Pfeffer was a Viennese widow um, uh, who decided that she wanted to travel <laughs> for the rest of her life, and she goes around the world more than once. Um, so, new signs of uh, the new safety, obviously, uh, that people who were handicapped uh, unprotected um, by a considerable masculine presence, for instance, could now go around the world. Um, it became important as well for individual nations to send ships or delegations around the world. And a lot of nations did this as soon as they felt like they could possibly do it. It was like joining a global club. Yes, we have mounted a circumnavigation. We did so in this, in this year. Um, the United States first did a circumnavigation in the 1780s, shortly after the American Revolution, an important demonstration of independence. Russia does it around the same time. China and Japan by the 1870s. So this is the global map made by the first Chinese circumnavigator uh, who goes around the world in the 1870s. Um, Korea does a circumnavigation. They send a diplomatic embassy around the world not long after this. Um, and so at the present day, uh, when nations still mark the first time, for instance, that they are able to put a satellite in orbit or to send an astronaut to the International Space Station. It still is a kind of important demonstration of your national um, prestige, uh, that you are part of the club uh, that has this kind of planetary presence. The around the world travelers who in the 19th century were pioneers in this democratization um, of circumnavigation were assisted by two important developments. Uh, first, the spread of European empires over most of the globe, which meant that a great deal of the world was made accessible to travelers from the global west, meaning from Europe and its offshoots, including the United States. Um, the second factor was the emergence and growth of commercial travel services, which we continue to benefit from, obviously. Um, that trend was very well represented in Jules Verne's novel, Around the World in 80 Days, when indeed it is commercial travel services that mostly send fog around the world. Um, this was possible after the opening of the Suez Canal, for instance, and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad across the United States. Um, in the very same year that Verne's novel appeared as a book, 1873, the English travel company, Thomas Cook & Son, organized the first around-the-world tour, uh, and it becomes a very common thing for travel services to offer from that time onward. If you can pay for this kind of travel, certain services would be provided for you. Uh, many other agencies throughout Europe would imitate that grand global package tour. Um, and shipping companies began to sell around the world tickets. These are great. These are often for a, a stated period of time. You could get off in Singapore, stay there for a while if you had business or you want to see things. And then you would catch the, the um, uh, ship uh, that would come around next. Um, and uh, sometimes the ticket would be available to you for two years or so. You can make your, round, your way around the world in leisure. Um, deciding to stay in different locations, simply catching a ship to continue is convenient to do so. Um, so it was glamorous to go around the world, deliberately. It was packaged as a very glamorous thing to do for your honeymoon, for your wedding anniversary, after graduating college, etc. Uh, so going around the world was glamorous, pleasurable, even joyful. Uh, this is one of my favorite illustrations from the period, uh, jazz age, 
couple um, dancing their way around the world. Over the 20th century, um, and now into the 21st, however, the confidence about the human ability in spanning the globe gave way to doubt. And that's the last act of geodrama, the one in which, unfortunately, we still kind of live. Um, technologically, newer forms of travel, especially airplanes and rocket-propelled um, space capsules, uh, revived the sense of extreme danger um, that had faded during the relatively safer 19th century. So just one famous example, Amelia Earhart was trying to set a record flying around the world when she was lost, trying to make a very perilous landing on tiny Howland Island uh, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So really aviation and then continuing into space travel um, revived a sense of the intense danger uh, that had faded uh, in the 19th century. Equally, it's now clear that it was imperialism uh, that had smoothed the way for most earlier circumnavigators under political and social circumstances that it would be impossible and unwise to try um, to reinstate. Um, above all, there's a growing sense that the planet is again beginning to bite back now that the environmental costs of planetary domination have begun to haunt us. To fly around the world takes a prodigious amount of fossil fuel to do that in a jet plane, a private plane, whatever. Going into orbit requires even more. So when the NASA space shuttle still operated, it required over 1,000 gallons of liquid fuel per second um, to achieve liftoff. Uh, this is a not an inconsiderable use of what we now know is a shrinking um, a supply uh, of energy and one that is damaging to the planet. This has meant that the new trend um, in circumnavigation is to demonstrate sus sustainable energy. Um, many sailing ships have done this um, so far, um, and Solar Impulse, the solar-powered airplane, wants to make uh, an entirely so solar-powered circumnavigation, indicating that the, that entire circuit of the planet remains an important measure or metric um, for how you measure anything, including sustainable energy. That is the most recent development in circumnavigation. I think today we live with all three legacies um, of around the world travel. We have a re-emerging fear that the planet could simply shrug us off. Um, we still have, however, continuing confidence that we might be able to generate technologies and political alliances to dominate the planet, yet we doubt that it's always wise to do so. Um, it's especially apparent at this point in our history that the characteristic confidence of the 19th century, especially the late 19th century, has been the shortest of historical experiences and perhaps the most atypical, yet obviously the most difficult to relinquish. We don't want to give that up. Our current doubts seem to be taking us back to the fears of the early modern period, a circular return that matches the swings around the planet that themselves went through the three acts of geodrama. Um, I want to stress, however, that there were always more hopeful elements to this story. And those bright moments matter too, uh, and they make it clear that the human past is as complicated and contradictory as its present, whether seen on a small scale or large, um, even the largest of all. Um, um, in tracing this history of planetary consciousness uh, as expressed through the history of around the world travel, I want to end by pointing out that um, individual circumnavigators are themselves aware um, of the history and the traditions that they are reenacting um, uh, that has really continued to the present day. Um, circumnavigators from very early on read each other's accounts and commented on each other's experiences and saw themselves as extending a process from the past into the future. Uh, they read each other's accounts as models for their own voyages and narratives. I'll just give a quick ge one genealogy of this. Um, so Sir Francis Drake read the account of Magellan's expedition William Dampier, a, favorite, a famous pirate circumnavigator, read Drake. George Anson read Dampier. Uh, Louis Antoine Bougainville read Anson. Um, a Russian circumnavigator Krusenstern read Bougainville. And then Charles Darwin, who sails around the world in the 1830s, read Krusenstern, and so on, even to the present day, when around the world sailors still all pretty much routinely read Joshua Slocum. Um, the first person to sail around the world alone. Um, he's a kind of canonical reading. You cannot be an around the world sailor without reading Slocum, um, uh, who himself read Darwin, so the genealogy continues. And even people who would go 
mm-hmm. around the world by different means, um, by bicycling, motorcycling, walking, etc., would refer back to the longer maritime tradition on which they thought they were building. We see this sense of history, for example, in the naming of spacecraft. Um, when NASA sent an unmanned expedition to orbit Venus, it was called Magellan. They, they, they chose very well um, by saying uh, that uh, this would be a famous circumnavigator, the first circumnavigation of Venus, so why not call it Magellan? It was also well named because the device did not make it back. <laughs> it resembled Magellan in that way, uh, like its namesake. It was programmed to descend um, into Venus's spacecraft meltingly hot atmosphere. So at some point it stopped transmitting data. Um, so it was, it was uh, unlike Magellan, timed uh, to die at a very certain moment. Um, this naming pattern was also true of several of the space shuttles which take a- took astronauts um, to orbit on the International Space Station. Um, several were named for famous circumnavigating vessels, including the Columbia, um, named for the first US vessel um, to make a circumnavigation. So, the history of our planetary consciousness is right there um, in these extended traditions of encompassing the entire planet, which go back to the start of the 16th century. Um, and it's a way in which we are early modern, even as we think we are very, very modern. Uh, we are planetary uh, because we uh, participate in and are aware of traditions that go back for half a millennium. Thank you. And I'm very happy to take questions if anyone has. Anything they would like to ask about? I was especially interested by the um, orb uh, being used uh, for individuals rather than just monarchs or, or, okay. or Christ. Um, this notion of certain navigation, it must be connected also to the idea of getting to the ends of the Earth in various directions, the end, ed- edges of the known Earth. But I mean, we think of Marco Polo, but I don't. As far as I know, no one even in the 15th century was thinking, can I get from the easternmost part of China to the southernmost part of Africa or something like this, over land even. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is that because land travel is so much more difficult than sea travel? Uh, uh, Marco Polo was there, what, in the 12th century or whatnot. Um, Well, land travel was much slower. Everyone recognized um, the maritime travel was, doesn't seem fast to us, but it was much faster. Um, than, than trying to go continentally over land, which is why a lot of con- intracontinental exploration was not done until the 19th century. It was, in right. fact, harder to do. Um, yeah, though people did have a sense that um, going across a large extent of the Earth, perhaps by sailing ship, would be a prodigious feat, even mm-hmm. impossible. So commentary, obviously, on Columbus uh, and on da Gama uh, for crossing mm-hmm. oceans um, going around the entire world, however, um, was more than the sum of its parts, mm-hmm. and I think recognized as such at the time. It had not been Magellan's original intention. Uh, he was just going to sneak up to the Spice Islands through the back door, as it were, and then go back the mm-hmm. same way. It's only after he dies, after the survivors are in um, Indonesia, um, that they realize they've gone around most of the world. Going back would mm-hmm. be crazy. Uh, And so they do an unintended circumnavigation, um, thus proving it was possible. But again, coming back with a tiny percentage of the crew, one ship was a big warning um, that uh, not what you would want to do every day. So seen qualitatively as being quite different from other kinds of uh, long distance travel, combining all of the dangers of uh, long distance. But even so, long distance travel, there were pre-existing trade, you were talking about commercial travel in the 19th Mm -hmm. century. There are trade networks back into uh, uh, ancient times, sure. going all the way to China. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how far into Africa the trade networks were continuous, but certainly into Ethiopia and, and mm-hmm. probably further than that. Um, but the idea that an individual would make the trips to, to go to the ends mm-hmm. of the earth doesn't seem to be, be an idea, or does it? Well, I guess it's an idea kind of glimmering into focus um, after expeditions like Columbus and da Gama. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, there did seem to be something qualitatively different about doing the entire globe uh, as a trading venture. Um, And indeed, the thing about Magellan survivors when they get back is everyone loses money on that. Mm -hmm. It was not lucrative. Mm -hmm. The king of Spain gets Mm -hmm. whatever um, advantage there might be and no one else does it. 
even anywhere near what they thought they would get out of that voyage. So it is um, a real question for a while about why you would want to do another one. Uh, mm -hmm. And indeed, given the attrition rates, um, not attractive necessarily to sign on for that. Mm -hmm. Given the cost, I mean, a good sailing ship was a real investment. Um, and to lose four or five of them was not something you would want to do lightly. So it remains a real question, well, why? What kind of trading voyage, for instance, would benefit um, from a whole circuit of the globe? Um, so it, it remains a kind of problematic uh, voyage to do through at least the early part of the 18th century, though people continue to try. Often, though, they are unintended. Uh, somebody gets further than they thought they were going to go, and they, they just continue, rather than go around all the other way. What specifically made it less lethal? Like, what was what was the big change? I mean, I, I assume most people got sick or starved. Yeah. So, or, you know, so what, did they just start bringing more food? I mean, did they just? More women. Yeah, more women. Yeah, they don't, they know, don't know about the citrus. Um, okay. it, scurvy was a big, big, big killer. And again, there's a cumulative effect. Crossing one ocean was bad enough. But your reward as a circumnavigator was there would be another one. Um, and people just could not bring enough food. Um, there's a political problem as well um, that for a lot of the globe, it was dangerous to make land and to get food. You were not welcome there. Uh, so the provisioning it's, was a kind of physical problem of getting enough on a ship. But then reprovisioning is a social and political problem. Uh, and that would not go away until the empires of the 19th century would say, no, sailing ships from particular nations have the right to stop there. That would help a lot. Now, interestingly, sailors um, referred to scurvy as earth sickness, meaning that they were sick for land. Um, it's, it's like being homesick. Um, and they were convinced that to make land itself, to breathe the air, just to be on the land, uh, would restore them. Because if it was a malady that existed at sea, then being on land should probably cure it. So there are accounts of sailors being buried in the earth. That would be even better, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. they were there in their little earth baths, um, soaking up whatever gave them strength. Um, but again, you've got to be able to make land to do that. And politically, that was a problem um, until late 18th, early 19th century. The, advan the rising survival rates, however, during the 18th century were probably due to more careful provisioning. There's an account of one of those ships where um, the ship is so tightly packed with provisions that they joke about having to eat their way through. Um, that would help, certainly. Um, the uh, work regimen was often altered as well. Um, so men would get more sleep and rest. Um, scurvy is one of those debilitating diseases where if you, if you begin to have it, any other stress on the body is going to accelerate it. So probably the modified work schedule helped as well. But they didn't pack a lot of lemons, the citrus cure. Um, not something uh, that they realized at that point. How would they pack lemons? I would go there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I thought that the, the big cure for scurvy was like sauerkraut. sauerkraut, yes, and it's so Is interesting. It it's so interesting. Um, NASA compares um, uh, space sickness, um, the, the bad effects on the body uh, by not having an Earth level of gravity, um, to scurvy. Um, and uh, NASA has said that they need something like sauerkraut. Um, sauerkraut didn't cure anybody of scurvy. Um, so. There is no magic bullet uh, in this scenario, actually. Um, it did seem that it was simply having more food, whether it had vitamin C in it or not, which people didn't understand until the 20th century, and having a modified work regimen um, that helped uh, to a certain extent. Now, um, even people like James Cook think that the land cure works, it, it, that earth sickness is the best way of describing scurvy. And he would order his men, whenever they made land, go for a walk, pick greens, and eat them. That probably helped, too. So not for the reasons he thought, um, but that probably would have assisted. If they can make land frequently enough to do that, that would help. Yeah, scurvy is a bad disease, must be said. Sorry, you had another question. Well, I did, actually. I was curious, the um, gaslight. I, I haven't read the Around the World in 80 Days. I, I, mm. I should go back to it. Um, but uh, the gaslight, one of the interesting things about gaslighting. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I can go back. 
it stays on, right. unlike yeah. the candle. So is that used as a metaphor that candles burn down and gas lights don't? That isn't mentioned explicitly, but obviously everyone reading the novel in 1872 would have understood that. Mm -hmm. um, why Phileas Fogg didn't have a friend or neighbor or housekeeper to turn the darn thing off? Um, yeah, I could have texted him. <laughs> right? They, Telegraph, it was called at the time. Um, but it, it's a great running joke, um, the cost, right. pennies and pennies right. and pennies. Right. And poor Passepartout is, is calculating, now what is he paying me and will that cover right. it? Um, and there's a great illustration at the very end where he's slumped in a chair reading the bill, which sort of scrolls down all over the floor. So they never give an estimate of how much fog has spent, though clearly by the end it's catastrophic. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just throwing money at people who can take him on the next leg. Um, but the gas lamp is a calculation uh, of how an ordinary person mm -hmm. would think of that. Mm -hmm. And that it's a kind of brilliant stroke, I think, mm -hmm. that he would have that imaginative touch um, to keep the tally. Yeah, I recommend the novel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank